Hello, everyone, and welcome to another wonderful episode of Stories About Fear with someone that's kind of far away today, all the way in New York. And we have Lawrence Sprung, CFP. And if you don't know what CFP is, I had to also Google it. It's Certified Financial Planner. So we are in for quite an amazing episode today. Now, my fearless friends, you know that I am in Eastern Europe. I am in Romania. We have about 30-something years of being communism-free. However, money mindset is uh, something that we still need to work on. And my fellow Romanians, if you are watching us and listening to us, you know what I mean. So today's episode is called Heal Your Money Mindset. You may ask yourself, why heal? Why money mindset? Well, it's because my amazing guest, which is extremely inspiring, and you'll see why in just a few seconds, has these two amazing topics that he deals with. Now, thank you to Matt Gilhuli that has given me such an awesome insight into Larry's life because... Larry was so kind to tap into these two topics when he was on his podcast. And my fearless friends, you know Matt, he's a friend of ours. He was here last month and I got to see so much insight, especially on mental health, because if we don't have a powerful mental health, we don't have too much. It all starts from there. A bit about Larry before... I'm going to give him the microphone today. Larry is a husband, father, entrepreneur, and mental health advocate. During his career, Larry has found that a lot of industry terms and concepts can seem confusing to outsiders. Yes, financial planning is pretty much confusing to many people, so great job. Larry in choosing something that is so beneficial to so many people. That's why he works with the families he serves to break down complex financial topics into easy to understand concepts. Larry is the author of the financial planning made personal and also the host of the Midland Money Mindset, a podcast that reminds you to ask yourself, What did you do today that brought you joy? I am absolutely loving this question so much. And yesterday was while I was preparing to get everything set up for today, I was thinking, you know, maybe I should pay closer attention to this question. Larry, welcome. It's such a privilege to have you with us today. Thank you, Roxanne. It's a pleasure to be here. And, uh, you know, again, like you said, big thank you to Matt and uh, for having me on his show and uh, allowing me to be introduced to somebody like you and, you know, give me the opportunity to be here with you and your listeners today. So thank you to him as well. Wonderful. Larry, I am pretty curious, and I'm sure that everyone watching and listening to us is. Can you please tell us what's your story? And how do you combine these two amazing concepts that to me personally seem very fascinating, mental health and finances? Yeah, so let let me, uh, you know, there's a lot to unpack there. So I'll kind of start with the, the, the last question first and then go backwards. You know, how I combine the, uh, the two, if you will, is because I, I think really life has, th- you know, is almost like a three-legged stool. And, and there are three things that are very important to all of us, whether we realize it or not, that are extremely intertwined and affect each other. And uh, that, you know, and those things are your financial health, your mental health, and your physical health. And if you think of those three things in, in you know, in individual terms, if you're suffering in any one of those areas, it makes it very difficult for you to be successful or concentrate in the other. If you're suffering mentally, it's hard for you to feel good about your financial situation or to exercise and take care of your physical. Uh, if your financial situation isn't great, it's hard to you know, have great mental health and also 
go and exercise. So they're very intertwined. So that's kind of how we've pulled everything together because we think that it's that important for those things to all work together and in sync with each other. In terms of how I got here, uh, you know, to really combine a very long story, um, essentially, you know, I, I grew up uh, in a uh, middle class family, uh, you know, just north of uh, Manhattan. And uh, we were, my family was not rich. We weren't poor either, uh, you know, solid middle class. My dad was a New York City school teacher and had, um, in addition to that, had a side hustle before it was a side hustle. He had a, a, a side job, a fruit and candy uh, business that he supplied uh, college bookstores with. And uh, when I was about 13 years old, my mom was diagnosed with cancer. And that kind of threw the whole family into a little bit of a whirlwind uh, because now everything changed, right? Her health was paramount, taking care of her. And I saw my dad go through the machinations of you know, having all these things on his shoulders, right? Taking care of the family financially, taking care of my mom's health, taking care of myself and my sister. And, you know, as I went on later in life, I realized, you know, he didn't have a financial advisor uh, or somebody that he could lean on and get assistance with. And not that that would have mitigated anything that the family went through, but I feel like if he would have had a plan, even in advance of my mom getting sick, or even when she got sick, had a plan in place, and having that person by his side could have been helpful and could have alleviated some of the stress and, and the headaches and the, and the challenges in his life. And as I went through high school and, and college, you know, I started learning more about the profession. Unfortunately, my mom ended up passing away at the age of 47. Uh, but the thing for me was I started learning about the profession and I was like, man, this is a great profession because it could allow me to help plan in advance of, you know, something catastrophic happening like it did for my family to help mitigate the impact. Or we could also help families plan for great occasions like buying a new house or buying a second home or planning for retirement if that's what they want to do or child's education, whatever that is. So I, I embarked on this path of going into the financial uh, profession, which has been unbelievably rewarding. And, you know, that is why when you introduce me, I, I don't talk about myself as a wealth advisor first. I talk about my family first because they are uh, at, at the paramount. They're most important to me. And that was really the first impetus in my life that showed me the value of family and how important health was. Uh, in terms of uh, family situation. Fast forward to graduate college, got into this profession. And uh, the second incident that really, you know, had a major impact on my life was uh, about a month before launching my firm in 2004, Midland Financial, uh, we tragically lost my brother-in-law to suicide. And that opened my eyes to, uh, you know, mental health and mental health challenges. I think prior to him, I never really understood that somebody who was having mental health challenges could die, uh, you know, and, and suicide was an option. I never encountered or had somebody personally uh, that died by suicide. So, and, and that really propelled me even further because I had just had my first child or my wife and I had our first child about 18 months prior. And, uh, you know, it really reinforced that family first mentality. So, and that's really what propelled me to become a mental health advocate. So that's a long-winded way of kind of giving your listeners a 10,000 foot view of kind of how I got into the profession, why we focus on family first, whether it's my family or the family that is part of Midland Financial, because they're part of our family as well. Um, and also, you know, to the name of your show, right? There, there were different uh, opportunities and challenges in my life that had I let fear or concern outside of even the whole entrepreneurial, keep in mind, I didn't talk anything really about business fear, really personal fear and challenges. Um, you know, I may not have ended up where I was today and could have ended up on down a much different path. Wow. What a story, Larry. Thank you so much for being so open about this. You have quite a lot of things to unpack. And what's really inspiring to me is that you used some really 
challenging times to your advantage, meaning that you truly used it, you got some great lessons, and now you are helping others to cope with similar situations. And when you mentioned suicide, I literally got chills because it's something that you don't really see. And I've seen many people that are smiling and being super happy and they seem fulfilled. They have pictures on Instagram with their families. And then a week later, they're gone. What would you say that around mental health? Maybe someone that's at the beginning of their entrepreneurial journey. What should we focus on more than anything? Yeah, I mean, listen, I think that, you know, as an entrepreneur and going through the entrepreneurial journey, there's always going to be challenges. And I think a lot of it comes down to mindset and how you're going to approach those, uh, those challenges. Uh, my mindset has always been that, you know, there are not, you know, there are never problems, there are only solutions and learning opportunities, right? And if we use those as learning opportunities, then, um, you know, we'll only grow as people, we'll grow as entrepreneurs. So, you know, you want to have the right mindset and you don't want to look at things from the glass being half empty. You want to look at it from the glass being half full and figure out why it's only half full and kind of work through those challenges. So, it's extremely important, you know, as an entrepreneur to have the right mindset because there, number one, there are a lot of challenges along the way. There are people in most cases relying on you in terms of their income and, and uh, you know, you supporting them. So there's a lot of responsibility there. And if you don't have a strong mental mindset, it could make it very difficult. So I think it's important to have the right mindset, number two. It's important to have others that you can, you know, have conversations with and discuss those challenges. And you want people who are on a similar path, a similar track in life to you that, that understand what you're going through. Um, and you want folks that are on the same level as you. And you also want a couple of people that maybe are well ahead of you who have kind of already worked through those challenges and can kind of guide you as well. So I think you, there's good perspective from both of those, but you know it all comes down to the right mindset, surrounding yourself with great people that can help you through the entrepreneurial journey and understanding that there are going to be challenges and having a game plan on how you're going to attack those and either solve them, learn from them, or just really you know blow through the wall and break through them. Love it. And I too, Larry, believe that without a mentor, you just have no guidance. You have no idea where to go next, what to do next. And as you said, entrepreneurship is challenging. Although, you know, in my opinion, I kind of see parenthood a bit more challenging. Please tell me what do you think about that, which is maybe a bit more challenging to you from your experience. Well, I think they're both challenging and I think they're both challenging for similar reasons, right? There's no manual, right? When you have a child, there's no manual that says, hey, this is how you you have to do it or this is what you should be doing. Uh, you know, we joke with my kids now, they're 17 and 20 and, and, you know, it's half joking and half serious. We tell my 20 year old that he was a little bit of the experiment. And, you know, most of the times the first child is because you don't know what you're doing. You're kind of thrown into this situation, not much different than entrepreneurship. You know, you may have a little bit, uh, you know, similarly, you have this vision of what it's supposed to be and what you want it to be. But ultimately, there's no manual for how to do it. So you have the first child and then you learn. And then the second child, typically, you know, things are a little bit easier and a little bit smoother because of the learnings and the teachings that you've gone through through child one. Uh, similar to the entrepreneurial journey, right? It, you know, your first business is always the toughest. It usually takes the longest to get up and running. Um, not that the second or the third is going to be easy, but there's definitely, if you've done it the right way, you should have learned some things through the process of that first business, just like you did through that first child and, uh, you know, make it easier for you to do what you want to do. So I think they're equally difficult. They're just different. Um, and I think both of them are challenging for the same reasons. There's really no 
definitive manual. There's no YouTube video that you could go watch or podcast that you, if you follow it to a T, you're going to be successful as a parent or successful as an entrepreneur. It's a little bit of pulling bits and pieces that work for you from all of those different things. Great answer. And if anyone that's in the field is listening to us, can you please get a manual at least for parenthood? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> that yeah. would be really appreciative. And going back to mental health, Larry, suicidal is something that many people have maybe dealt with, suicidal thoughts, but not many have the courage to get help. When it comes to your fears, what would you say that the best way that you dealt with this, what would be the best advice that you could give to someone that's maybe young at the beginning of their journey? And have you in any way asked for help regarding your fears and stress? How was it for you? Yeah. So let, let me first and foremost say, I am not a medical practitioner. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a therapist. I'm just an average person who uh, just happened to have a family member that passed away uh, by suicide and became very involved in the mental health space. I sat on the national board for the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention for about uh, 12 or 13 years. I currently sit on their finance and investment committee. So I, I've learned through that process. Uh, but to answer your question, for me, you know, I, I think inherently people are built uh, a certain way. And what I mean by that is, and to use my brother-in-law as an example, you know, my brother-in-law and I could have experienced the same exact thing at the same exact time. And he could have felt a lot of stress over it, a lot of anxiety issues, and I could have been fine with it. And really, the only difference between he and I was the way that our brains processed it, right? That was really the only difference. And, you know, I think to some degree, entrepreneurship, sometimes we also tend to look at things through our own lens, right? And, and, and this is just life. And I, I tell this often, you know, a lot of times it's about perspective. Uh, if you're walking down the street and you see a little pebble on the road in front of you and you pick it up and you put it right in front of your eye, you know, it's going to look like a boulder, like something that you're not going to be able to get around. But if you do the same thing with that with that pebble and put it out at an arm's length in front of you, two to three feet out, you see it for what it is, which is a pebble and something that's very easily, you know, navigated and you can get around. Um, so you have to maintain that perspective. I think the important thing is, it, you know, is number one, if you need help or you're having challenges or struggles, I think the important thing is that you ask somebody for help, you know, somebody who you trust, whether that's a mentor, like we talked, whether that's a family member, or if there's nobody that's uh, in your life in that capacity, then even finding a therapist or a counselor to help help you with those challenges. I think that's an important part to ask for help. Um, and then, you know, in terms of other entrepreneurs, they're there and, and find a community that you could tap into because I assure you that whatever you're going through uh, in that moment or went through, somebody else probably has had a similar experience. And you know, we, we call it experience sharing. You don't wanna be told what to do. You don't wanna somebody say, this is what you should do. But I think it's very helpful if you have a community of people that could say to you, hey, I've experienced that. This is what I experienced. This is how I overcame the challenge. I don't know if that'll work for you, but hopefully that's helpful to you. And I think that's important. So, you know, just to, you know, I think it's important, number one, to ask for help if you need it. Uh, if you're experiencing those challenges, you have to work on your mindset um, and, and utilize whatever tools you can and then tap into those resources that you have within your entrepreneurial community and see if others are experiencing similar or have experienced similar uh, things that they can help you uh, navigate through that troubling time, whatever, whatever it is or whatever the reason is. I so appreciate this, Larry, that you tell people to ask for help because it's truly high time that we remove the stigma of shame and guilt 
on top of us already feeling fear and stress and other really challenging thoughts. So might as well, let's not go into that area of putting even more pressure, pressure on ourselves, which is what our very complex mind does. So our fearless friends ask for help. Many of your friends are just a click away. You don't need to carry this burden on your own because I know I was there. Larry had quite some experiences. And as I'm truly grateful to hear Larry share, you need to be very mindful that things can change in the blink of an eye. But although it's tough now, it's not real because what happens in your mind, my fearless friends, it's not real. You can play with it. You can mingle with it so that you can get stress and fear to work to your advantage. And Larry, would you say that fear has maybe taught you anything? Is there a lesson maybe that you want to share with us? Yeah, Roxanne, that's a great question. But before I share that, I would also say, not only if you're an entrepreneur and you're struggling, should you ask for help, but if you're an entrepreneur, just a person, and you see somebody else who you think may be struggling, maybe you're right, maybe you're wrong. I would also encourage you to ask that person, are you okay? You know, and, and reach out to them and be proactive and say, hey, I saw this going on, or I saw you say this, I saw you do this. Is everything okay? Because that can go a long way as well. So don't only ask for yourself, but if you see others that may have uh, be struggling or go through a challenge, I would uh, you know encourage you to ask them if they're okay as well. Uh, but back to your question about fear, I mean, listen, I, I think that there are ways, and, and I think I've done it to some degree that I've utilized fear in a way that has helped uh, propel me, right? Um, you know, in a way that's in a positive way. I've seen families, my own, go through uh, challenges and struggles. And it's important for me to work and be cognizant of my mindset, uh, which helps me focus on what we need to do. And I try to look at things in terms of half full and not half empty and try to, uh, you know, be able to navigate challenges. And I also Quite frankly, I have a great network of people, uh, first and foremost, my wife, and then secondly, my kids, because at this point, they're pretty much young adults that I can bounce things off of, too. And, you know, sometimes being young, they have some great perspective on certain things and can share things as well. And then outside of the immediate family, you know, the, my business network and other entrepreneurs that I, I know. So it, it's something that I've certainly used. I, I would say, you know, when you go through events like I went through having a mom that was sick and then eventually ended up passing away at such a young age and, and seeing my brother-in-law pass away at the age of 27, you know, there are very few things that get you scared, right? You know, as long as I, you know, in terms of if I have my family and we have our health, you know, in my view, kind of everything else will eventually work its way, work itself out. I'm not going to say that I'm not going to do anything to help it, but outside of that, there's not a lot of things that I'm fearful of, you know, um, I'm just, you know, I, I probably do more work on my physical and my mental health and feel that the entrepreneurial things will, if I concentrate on those two things, the entrepreneurial stuff will eventually uh, work out uh, in a way that uh, is a success. This makes so much sense. And about your physical health, you got me curious. What do you do more often to keep yourself in a great physical condition? Well, I wouldn't say I'm in great. I, I would say I'm in okay. I could always be better, but uh, I'm a big Peloton rider. Uh, there was a long period of time that I did not go, uh, that I didn't exercise at all. Um, not because I didn't want to, I just couldn't find something that worked for me. And uh, when I finally purchased the Peloton, it really was a game changer. And I probably ride anywhere between three to five times a week, depending upon the time of the year. Um, that's hugely beneficial. And then uh, I also am a big, you know, my family's a big hockey family. So I do play ho ice hockey 
uh, from time to time when I can. And uh, I don't know that there's a lot of physical activity, but uh, on the spring and summer, I spend a lot of time on the golf course with my boys, uh, you know, more swinging the club and walking, not a lot of physical exertion. But, you know, I think the important thing and the takeaway for me, for your listeners would be, if you're finding yourself not active, just keep searching for something that you like, that you enjoy, and just keep doing it. You know, I enjoy going on the Peloton, depending on the day, I'll put on a, you know, different type of music class for it. And, you know, sometimes if I have a rough day, I may put on like heavy metal or EDM music just to kind of, you know, get out that excess energy. And then other days I may have had a tough day and I don't want to do that. And I do a yacht rock ride where it's a little bit more casual and easy. So just find something you like and do it and, and get some, you know, benefits from the physical health out of it. Great answer, Larry. I really felt the need to ask you this because at the beginning of our conversation, when I got your introduction ready, I said that, you know, you can't do too much if you don't have a strong mental health. Well, I kind of forgot to mention physical health because let's be honest, we need this, this body of ours to be in the best shape ever. And as you said, it can always be better. We can always do more. We can always work out more, but it's really good to focus on this as well because the more you move, the more oxygen you have to your brain, in your brain, which really gets you to not go into depression or into anxiety and stress. So I think this is a really important part of keeping your mental health up and running, so to say, keep your physical body as healthy and as active as possible. Larry, thank you for this. And yeah, Roxana, I would just add, I don't know if, uh, you know, if you or your listeners are familiar, probably are Warren Buffett uh, here in the States, the Oracle of Omaha. We are. And, and I'm going to botch this up and I'm not going to, you know, don't quote me on this, but you could probably Google it and, and uh, check it out. You know, he has, he's talked about and talk to students about taking care of your health, your physical health, and most importantly, in your body. And, and the way he translates it is, imagine if when you were born or when you were able to drive, you were given a car and you were told that that car was the only car you would ever have during your lifetime. You, you wouldn't be able to buy another car ever again. That was the one car for you and for your life. Think about what you would do. You know, would you get the oil changes on time? Would you make sure that you got the engine checked? You know, doing all those things, those maintenance things that maybe you don't think about because most people don't have cars that long these days. But if it was the only car, how would you take care of that? Well, you take care of it like it was your only car. Make sure it was pristine. Well, you know what? Your body is the only body you're going to get in your lifetime. So why not take care of that the same way and translate that thought process around that car to your own body? And uh, again, I'm not doing his story justice, but you, you get the point. And I, I think it translates very well. And, uh, you know, I think when we talk about body, we talk about the physical and the mental uh, components at the same time. I appreciate that. What an amazing metaphor. And I'm so happy you brought him up because I think he's now 88, if I'm not mistaken. How old is he? I think he's older than that. I think he's oh in his 90s God. at this point. Oh, yeah. my God. Yeah. I I truly loved his really calm and such compassionate nature. Every time I would listen to him talk a few years ago, I'd have this wow, you know, people with money are so nice and kind and genuine because let me tell you like a short story. Growing up here in Romania, up until my early 20s, I really thought that people that have money are evil people. So seeing Warren Buffett on YouTube a, a few years ago, maybe 10 years ago, I would be thinking, okay, so it's hope for the world because obviously, Larry, deep down, I wanted money. But I had this huge conflict, like, I want to stay away from people that have money because they maybe have killed someone or, you know, all these really distorted thoughts about wealth and abundance. So Warren really played such an important role in me wanting to work more on this aspect. So thank you for bringing him up. And 
Larry, we have something really important to talk about, and it's your great book, Financial Planning Made Personal. Can you please tell us before we go, what inspired you to write this great book? And maybe what's your favorite part of it? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, it was probably 10 years in the making. Um, mm -hmm. And the reason why I didn't write it was I just didn't have time. As I mentioned, my family came first. So for a, a lot of years, both my boys were playing travel ice hockey. So my wife and I were shuttling them to practices during the week. Many times we were in different states on the weekends. I just didn't have the time. And, uh, you know, fast forward to about two years ago, um, my older son went to college and my younger son at the age of 15 went to boarding school, went to prep school. And we found ourselves, I found myself with a lot of free time. So we decided it was time. So I, pu I put the book together and really what it is, is it's a compilation of really a lot of stories and concepts about financial planning and how it's personal and it basically takes a shot at a lot of the so-called pundits that uh, you probably see regularly on TV or in social media or even on, on the internet, YouTube, et cetera, that constantly talk about people should be doing this or people should be doing that. And this is the rule of thumb that you should be doing. And the reality is some of that's true that you know some of those rules of thumb do work uh, but really, the reality of it, financial planning is really personal. And, you know, it really comes down to there's nothing wrong with, for example, going on vacation. There's nothing wrong with spending money, three, four dollars on a cup of coffee. As long as it's planned for and budgeted for, that's OK. You, you know, we have to get joy along the way. So to answer your question about the part about what part of the book um, that I enjoy. I really love the whole book, but I think the thing that resonates the most is when I talk about joy and, and the fact that we've utilized this tagline and we've trademarked it called, you know, what is it? What did you do today that brought you joy? I have it on shirts and I walk through airports and people stop me to take pictures of it. They say, that's a great saying. Um, I tell a story in the book when I was at Disney, I was on line for a ride. And one of the cast members, I'm walking up to go out to the ride, and one of the cast members said, says, I ate a bag of Hershey Kisses today. And I look at my kids. I'm like, what the heck is she talking? I'm like, okay, great. That's good. I, I look at my kids. I look at my wife. I'm like, what is she talking about? And they're like, look at your shirt, dope. And it said, what did you do today that brought me? She was answering the question. So it's a very thought-provoking question. And I, I think that that's probably one of the best and I, I think yeah. most humorous parts of the book. But I, I think there are a lot of good nuggets that people who, if they haven't started on their financial planning journey or they're in the midst of it, it's a great opportunity to understand and validate you know, what they should be doing or maybe what they're doing already and, and give them some food for thought on how personal financial planning really is because it can't be done in the masses. You know, Chat GPT is not going to be able to do personal financial planning for people. It's just not going to uh, be a mechanism that's going to work well. Wow. I love this, Larry. Great story with your t-shirt. This is something that I remember for sure. Mm -hmm. And yeah, my fearless friends have a look at Larry's amazing content. He is really active on Twitter, which I really enjoy because I get inspired from everything that he goes through. He posts a lot of really useful and valuable knowledge. Now, besides Twitter, of course, and besides your amazing book, which I'm going to have it linked in the description of our episode, Larry, where can our listeners and viewers get in touch with you and your amazing content? Yeah, so I mean, the two easiest places are mitlinfinancial.com, M-I-T-L-I-N, financial.com. That's our website. The book site is financialplanningmadepersonal.com, which also links back to Mitlin. And then in addition to Twitter, I'm basically on you know most of the other social media platforms. You can find me either under Larry or Lawrence Sprung. And uh, if, if worst case scenario, you don't want to do that, just Google me and you'll find a lot of uh, links back to me and and availabilities to reach out and connect. 
I love it. And Larry, thank you for an amazing and really thought-provoking and inspiring episodes today. I am truly grateful for all your knowledge and wisdom, and I can't wait to see what you are going to create next. Thank you for being here with us today. Thank you, Roxanne. I appreciate it. I hope you and your listeners enjoy the rest of their day. Thank you. Thank you so much.